Welcome. Um, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, Multnomah County Health Officer Dr. Jennifer Vines is joined by Communicable Disease Director Kim Taves. So um, they'll give a brief update on disease spread and contact tracing, um, and then we'll turn it over to you for your questions. Um, so I will mute myself and Dr. Great. So good morning, everybody. This is uh, Dr. Jennifer Vines, Multnomah County Health Officer. Um, thanks for, for joining us. Um, I'll just give a, a brief overview and then I'll turn it over to Kim Taves to fill in some additional details. Uh, as we look at cases from last week, we're at a total of 452. Uh, there is still the lab result lag time, so we expect that number may uh, still be revised. And that was compared to 596 for the week prior. Um, so that's still the second highest week uh, overall for Multnomah County. Hospitalizations are staying relatively the same. Uh, disease in our population is probably the highest it's ever been. Uh, it's mostly east of the river as we look at zip codes, but uh, it is spreading in several, uh, several neighborhoods uh, now beyond uh, East County. Uh, we still unfortunately see that Latinx are the most disproportionately affected, uh, followed by uh, Pacific Islanders, uh, Black, African American, and African immigrants. As we talked about last week, uh, the average age has dropped. Um, we now see the age group of 10 to 19 year olds with the highest relative rate of positivity. So this, this group um, is not tested as often, uh, but their test positivity uh, is, uh, is high. Um, and we're also seeing reports now emerging from the medical literature of young people with no underlying health conditions uh, with recovering, uh, taking up to uh, several weeks for them to feel, to feel back to normal. So with an average last week of approximately 65 cases per day, again, subject to change as lab results come in, um, uh, we do uh, turn to contact tracing uh, as our main uh, tool right now, in addition to all the behaviors that we're asking of the public. Um, we continue to see uh, people gathering in big groups of families and friends. Um, I don't think at this point we can let our guard down uh, uh, or think that cases are going to drop uh, simply because uh, we still just see people uh, gathering in groups um, and uh, socializing with their with their close contacts, family and friends. Uh, just a few examples um, from last week. This was sort of one one day. Uh, uh, several Fourth of July gatherings, um, a large family pool party, uh, someone who attended a company conference with 150 other people, uh, getting a condo with seven other individuals a group camping trip, and an engagement party. So those are just some, some examples of where uh, we are finding uh, people potentially transmitting the virus. Um, still almost two thirds, 62% uh, of our cases are not traced to a known source. Uh, we are starting to see less cooperation from uh, individuals and employers. Um, so as an example, someone living with uh, several friends doesn't care to provide contact information for their roommates. They say, you know, I'll, I'll let them know. Um, so we're still putting in place supports for isolation and quarantine, and we're hoping that as word gets out um, uh, about those supports that um, that might change uh, people's attitudes in the coming weeks uh, around their, their case interviews and identification of contacts. Uh, finally, again, testing continues to be a challenge with long lag times. Uh, our priorities are still anyone with symptoms and anyone with contact uh, to a known confirmed case. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kim Taves, who is uh, closer to this work, uh, to fill in some additional, some additional detail and texture uh, of this work for you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Kim Taves, uh, Multnomah County Communicable Disease Services Director. Uh, good to have you all join us today. I just wanted to really reemphasize uh, what Dr. Vines has been discussing in terms of people's social interactions and group settings. And to that end, I wanna encourage people to consider taking note, whether it's on your calendar or your phone or some other way. Actually, honestly, every day, if you are someone who is out of your house, is socializing with other people, if you do have a workplace uh, that has uh, groups of people coming together in close proximity to each other, who we count as a contact is anyone that you spend more than 15 minutes with that is within six feet of distance from you. Uh, we count those as contacts whether or not uh, people are covering their faces, although covering your face is really super helpful and significant. But when you think about getting a call from public health and saying, we really need to understand who might also have been at risk, who you may have exposed to the infection, who may now be infected themselves, 
maybe at a very infectious time, which is usually the day or two days before they become symptomatic. And the call from us to let them know that would really help them slow the chance that they would then spread the infection to another people. Uh, it's, all, it's not always easy for people to remember for, let's say, the last 10 days, who exactly were they with and how close and for how long. Um, we are requesting that people actually take note of that so that um, that's information that you have that you can refer back to to see who you may need to let know and help us help them to let them know. Um, again, it's anyone that you've been within six feet of contact or 15 minutes or more duration of time. And it may be interesting for folks to do that for a week and see if maybe they're having a little bit more connection and opportunity to become infected or to infect other people than they had been aware. I think normally in our lives, we all walk through the world as a very socially connected beings. That's just human nature. And it, it, uh, you may feel like you're doing your part and you have really reduced the number of family members and friends and social gatherings you're at. And that may very well be true. Uh, but it's good to sort of take stock of that yourself and get your own, what we would call observable data. Uh, gather your own data for yourself and check some of your, your own um, assumptions about how much time you're spending with people and have that information um, able to be used for us. We uh, do have contracts that have gone out to many different community-based organizations and the state public health division is adding more contracts to different community partners. The goal of those folks is to have outreach workers and community health workers that can help people connect to resources. So the goal is really for us to not just be asking people to quarantine or isolate and stay home, but also to really work with them very collaboratively to figure out what kind of resources do they need to honestly be able to do that. And that may be everything from um, setting up grocery delivery to, to helping cover rent. Um, there's all sorts of things people may need, cleaning products or masks, et cetera. So we're working hard on, on setting up um, those processes and those pathways for folks so that it's not just a, a call from us, but it also is a, is a call with an offer for resources. So I do wanna reiterate that as well. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about today about something we talked a little bit about at the board briefing this past week, uh, last Thursday, about something called r not, And that's a, a science uh, term, and I'm going to explain to folks what it means. People may have seen it in articles uh, or uh, discussions online that they have um, been able to read and partake in over the last few months. That's a number in an equation, and there's a different number for every different disease. And what it means is how many people does one sick person infect on average if none of us do anything to try to prevent it? Uh, and each disease is maybe less infectious or more infectious. Some diseases are infectious for a long time period and others for a very short time period. Some diseases you don't need to be that close to someone to infect them and others you need to really have very intimate contact to infect them. All of those kinds of things affect the reproduction number, which is what R stands for. So what you can imagine is if one person who's sick infects fewer on average than one other person, eventually the disease will just naturally die out of the population because it's not spreading as much as it's um, being limited. If one person on average infects two or three or four people, you can imagine that after a number of days, there's an exponential increase. So what we've seen locally, our rough estimate, uh, the best, uh, the most accurate we can get is that probably since about mid-May, when we started to have an increase in cases, we're at about 1.5. So on average, that means that for every one person who's infected, they're probably spreading it to another one and a half people. And you can see by that, that we are gonna continue to grow cases more and more. And the things that we can do to affect that are the things that prevent people from being able to be infected. So someone's infected, the virus is gonna leave their body. And obviously the first line of, of protection for everyone else is the mask. That really will minimize how much virus gets out into the air, lands on surfaces that can be touched. Um, but the other things that impact that is if the virus leaves and there's no one around to infect within the six feet that's, that it takes to infect them, then during that infectious period, the person, the virus won't be able to spread. If those other people have a protection that doesn't let the virus into their body, that's also obviously going to limit the spread. Um, if you, uh, with, with this, we know that people are infectious one, two, three days before they become symptomatic and their symptoms are quite mild. And that's why early on in our disease, we talked a lot about hand washing, but we also just really focused very heavily on the message, stay home if you feel sick. And that's when we didn't know yet that a lot of folks have very mild illness that they may not notice. 
can, people can have lots of different symptoms than we originally thought. We originally thought it was simple enough to say fever, cough, shortness of breath, stay home, and that that would really limit it. And now we know this virus is tricky, and so we have to really implement these other pieces of, of the plan. So I just wanted to describe that and, and a little bit of the science behind that so that you understand that we can make environments more safe, but people can also make individual choices to the extent that they can that are more safe and that workplaces can protect their workers and their customers and also help do their part to make things more safe. Um, let's see, what else? I do wanna mention that our own county, uh, East County community testing site drive through due to the heat today will be closed this afternoon. And I mentioned that because it's about 100 that we expect it to be and folks are on the black asphalt for hours at a time wearing um, their multiple layers of suits to protect themselves when they do the testing, including the, the full, um, what we call a papper, the full gear that protects their breathing. Uh, and we've decided that today, just for this afternoon, that that's, that's gonna be too hot for folks. So I'll just mention that to people. And I think with that, I will turn it over to um, questions from all of you. Yeah, and you guys should be able to unmute yourself and ask your questions. And if anybody has a question that requires some follow-up, I'll just jot it down and um, follow up you with you after, after this. I have a question. Uh, I think this is probably for Dr. Vines, but um, we're hearing from uh, some teachers that they want 14 to go, days to go by without an 80 without any new infections in order for students to return to school. Dr. Vines, do you think that that's an achievable metric? And what metrics should parents be looking at if they're determining whether or not they want their kids to go back to in-person class this fall? Sure, so thanks for the question. Um, I think the governor uh, will be sharing information this week about criteria for reopening schools that, that will be based on disease spread metrics. Um, I know she has asked for uh, input. I don't know exactly uh, what the state will announce, but we do expect uh, parents to have some guidance uh, some, sometime this week to have a clear understanding um, of where their community is in terms of virus spread and what that means for in-person school uh, versus distance learning. Hi, it's Brad Schmidt at The Oregonian. Um, I, I know, I think it was in early June, right when you guys opened up your testing location in Gresham, you said that there was plans for a mid-county location. We're almost in August. Um, could you give me an update on whether the mid-county location is opened or when it will open? Uh, sure, we'll be meeting about that this uh, this week and next week with partners um, we've been in a hiring process uh, and we're interviewing candidates right now to have a full team of community health nurses and certified medical assistants to not only be able to relieve our primary care clinicians uh, and staff so that they can go back to their regular primary care duties. Uh, August 15th, they'll be swapping out uh, and then public health will have our, our dedicated testing team take over. That's, uh, county process is a little bit slow to, to staff up to have the full set of folks that we'll need to also um, identify sites somewhere between Mid County and Rockwood and be able to, to add that. Um, so look for news about that, I would say in the next 14 days. So just to be clear, that would be news within the next 14 days that it will be opening within the next 14 days or news that the opening will be beyond the 14 day period? Yeah, I don't, I don't expect that we'll be opening it in 14 days. We'll be opening it soon, but within 14 days, I think that we will um, be on our way to having a site uh, located. We'd, who um, think that we'll probably be looking for a collaborative site to co-host with us and some different organizations have come forward and said that they're willing to discuss that with us uh, and we'll have staff hired and we'll be able to go ahead and, and start soon after that. Yeah. Great, and just final thing on that. Um, given that these are some of the hardest hit uh, zip codes in uh, all of Multnomah County, mm -hmm. um, I mean, can you address whether this is problematic that it's taking this long to open the location um, within, within these areas? Uh, I think that uh, we're very appreciative of the fact that um, the safety net clinics uh, and healthcare providers, as well as the the places where people can seek urgent care and especially OHSU has done extensive work um, to try to make testing available. 
Uh, public health is always just a small part of clinical services. Normally we lean on our, our broad, although complicated set of healthcare partners to really take the lead in providing testing and clinical services, and then we try to fill in the gaps. Uh, it definitely um, would have been great if we had had this site as well as our East County site open four weeks or eight weeks ago, um, but we are uh, on the way to do that. Dr. Vines, just a, a detailed question. You talk about the number of cases in the county uh, this week versus last. Which dates are you using for that? Yeah, so it's usually by calendar week, Pat. If you want exact dates and numbers, let me let me have Kate get you get you the really detailed information. It's okay. usually by the week the week of starting starting that Monday. Starting on Mondays, okay. Kate, Great. yeah, typically. Can let me you text I'll ask everyone Kate. the link. Kate, can you? Can oh you yes, to the dashboard. The link to the regional dashboard so that people can see. We'll do, yes, and that you. includes it. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Also, I was wondering, uh, why do you think Latinx is, population is most impacted? I can offer an answer and then I'll ask him to, to fill in. I think um, what we're seeing is these are essential workers. Um, so these are uh, people who are having to go to work, um, who may be in uh, crowd, more crowded housing or multi-generational households. Um, and I think that uh, st structurally, they are more at risk by virtue of their their occupations and some of the uh, the housing and social um, social choices that they have. Kim, do you want to elaborate? Because it's, it's it's a great question and an important one. Yeah, I think it's multifaceted. Like Dr. Vines mentioned, um, there are certain essential service industries like uh, food processing plants we have seen be a, a high risk place, frankly, uh, and, and there are a number of food processing plants in our area that have had a number of outbreaks and they've been some of our largest outbreaks for sure. Uh, and there's usually some community transmission. Uh, sometimes some of the risk is not just at the work site for places. Uh, we are seeing uh, with some outbreaks we're having in uh, construction sites or contractor sites that people may be um, able to take prevention messages when they're on site but need some more education or support, thinking through things like carpooling together to the work site. Um, there is spread within, uh, you know, uh, close up housing with multiple generations of folks as well as in apartment buildings. Um, and sometimes that has overlapped with work sites. So maybe someone's risk was their work site exposure. And then they've also then exposed folks in their household. I think for folks who, um, our recent immigrants who don't speak English, and I'm saying this for all populations of immigrants, um, as well as some folks who uh, are undocumented or don't have uh, immigration status that, that feels as safe or able for them to access healthcare promptly, to access the other supports they need, um, that can be something that, that is a real barrier for folks. And I also know that not everybody understands or is informed by their employer about what the current sick leave policy is for COVID-19. And they're really concerned about staying home when they're sick or when they're in contact in terms of the wages that they will have lost or even in terms of their job security. Um, and I, I think that we're all aware that some of our communities of color because of structural racism historically, um, you know, are, have a higher rate of um, low income families where some of those barriers become, become really significant to both um, finding out that you have COVID, uh, being exposed to it, and then also to uh, accessing healthcare uh, if you do get sick and you need a higher level of care for yourself. And in terms of that severity of illness, then we know that there's also some um, significant reasons that there are histories of uh, higher rates of chronic disease. That unfortunately means that when someone is exposed and gets sick, they have a higher rate of a severe illness. Uh, thank you. And if nobody else has questions, I do have a couple others. Uh, Kim, you and I talked last week about the lag time in testing. Is it still about the same as far as 10 or 11 days? Uh, each lab is different. Uh, we use Quest, which is one of the larger commercial labs for any of the direct services that Multnomah County Health Department provides clinically. Uh, we just got the update this morning that the lag time is now seven to eight days. A little bit better, uh, still too slow. Um, some of the, the tests that are um, rapid tests, they do have obviously a much faster turnaround time, but the rapid tests are not high volume. They have to be done like one single specimen at a time. So there's a lot of variation across all the different health systems in terms of if people are, are using the test that is more accurate but takes a, a day or two days or now seven or eight days to get back versus a rapid test. 
Uh, so it's not ubiquitous, but we are seeing in general, on average, that there in overall, there, there is lab decrease because I think that some of the, the testing numbers that we expected to be reported last week dropped a bit. Um, and I, th I think that drop is not because people stopped testing. I think that drop is just because the, the lab results haven't come in yet and they haven't gotten reported to us yet. So that's another way we sort of try to keep the finger on the pulse of the lab capacity right now. Okay, thanks. And then um, I guess final question probably for each of you is, uh, Dr. Vines, you mentioned um, the types of big gatherings where, so you mentioned a number of those, company gatherings, 4th of July parties, that sort of thing. I just wanted to clarify, are those groups that your tracers found by tracing back and saying, oh, I see that happened. So that's question one. Number two, uh, maybe it answers the same thing. Are we just now starting to see exposures from the 4th of July become positive testing? I th yeah, great question. So I think um, it's typically about two to three weeks before we see the effects of um, choices people make around mixing and, and viral spread. So it makes sense that we would have started to see uh, July 4th gatherings kind of show up as positive tests last week. Um, as far as um, your question about how, how we're sort of find, finding where people might have been exposed, that is part of the contact tracing interview. Um, and so we do ask people um, uh, mostly focused on where they spent time during the period that they were infectious. Uh, and so that gives us some clue as to, as to their behaviors. Um, because of the volume of cases, we don't always have the chance to do a full extensive inter interview to really try to pinpoint um, the source of where they may have picked up their infection, if that, if that makes sense. And Kim, you might be able to put a finer point on it. Sure, we're tending to focus more on looking forward. If we have someone who's infected, uh, the most important thing for us is to figure out who may they have spread it to in the last few days that we need to notify. Uh, in the ideal world, we'd also do really careful mapping to see who was the person who they may have gotten it from. Uh, but sometimes, especially when we're now dealing with 100, you know, 60 to 100 cases every single day, uh, that level of tracing um, is beyond us right now. And that's a level of tracing we might do with some other diseases that are more rare. Um, so that's in part why looking backwards to see, well, what did you do that puts you at risk for you getting infected is not as much of a focus as who else do we need to worry about moving forward. But they all talk to us about um, behavior patterns. And I want to say that in a way that um, I want to assure folks that you are not going to get us shaming you on the phone when we talk to you. Public health is, is very collaborative and we understand that people make all sorts of different personal decisions for all sorts of reasons. You're going to get friendly, safe folks on the phone to talk to. Um, but as we see patterns emerge, we do feel like it's really important for us to work with media and with our community partners to help get the word out that those behaviors right now are not well matched to the amount of disease transmission that we have right now. And so we do really want to let folks know you may feel like that's an exception, but if enough folks do that, um, there's significant impact. And I think, I think people who are hosting some of those parties feel a little bit bad afterwards that they felt like they, had, they, they were safe enough because nobody actually wants to invite 15 people over and then have to call them a week later and say, you know what, someone was ill, I found out about, but didn't know it yet. And I now need to notify all 15 of you that you may have gotten infected as something I hosted. I know people have some chagrin when they're in that experience. And so we're passing that on to other folks for their own wisdom about that. Well, and I wonder with the governor's new rules in place, if people do have a gathering of 15, they don't want to tell you that because it's bigger than the limit. Well, and I do want to let folks know we're not turning over information to law enforcement. Uh, and I think our local law enforcement has also been pretty clear about how they will and they will not utilize information to, right, to um, support or to, to intervene with people and what their behaviors are about the executive order. So we're really relying on folks to make good choices for themselves and for their family and friends. Um, and our role in public health is, is uh, in this way is not regulatory. Okay, and I lied when I said the last one was the last question because you have so much interesting stuff to say, it brings up more questions. Uh, maybe Dr. Vines or both of you, if 65% are untraceable uh, you know, to a specific cause, doesn't that mean we may never get ahead of this thing? Yeah, so it hints, it, it hints at what we already are seeing, which is that this disease is widespread in Multnomah County. Um, 
Kim nicely explained the R naught. So for every person who's infected, they are infecting more than one more person, which means this is going to continue slowly, sort of like a slow compound interest in terms of infections, unless we do something to turn that around. So um, we're emphasizing um, uh, what we can at, at the policy level. You see that in the restrictions uh, on gatherings. Um, but we really have to emphasize uh, individual behaviors and that, that, that monitoring of the number and closeness of social contacts that people have. So will we get ahead of this? Um, my strong hope is uh, yes, eventually. But back to Lachey's original question um, around you know, metrics to open schools, um, my expectation is that cases will, will continue to increase uh, sim simply based on, on what we know right now. Um, my hope is that that increases slows that, that the, the pace of increase slows um, and that we do eventually get a handle on it, but it will not, it will not be public health alone. It will be uh, very much uh, the public, I think, um, routinely using face coverings and really monitoring their social interactions. Kim, would you like to add anything? Nope. Hey, it's Brad Schmidt at the Oregonian again. Um, I had a question about contact tracing. Um, where are you guys at on staffing? What's the specific number? And have you hired everybody that you were looking to do? Um, if not, uh, what's the timeline now? And uh, then how, you said that you're not doing the full contact tracing that you would in a perfect world. Um, if you're told of a close contact, do you contact them or are you not actually reaching all the close contacts that you know about? And what is the timeline for actually reaching all of those close contacts? Uh, that's a good few questions there. Uh, I, I don't have the number uh, on hand, but I have it in a spreadsheet. I won't be able to pull it up right now this second, um, but I could uh, give it to Kate to get to you this afternoon about uh, exactly how many folks we've hired. We've hired the vast majority of folks. I think we're still looking for some folks who have some language capacity in a couple different areas. Uh, we've been onboarding people successfully in staggered weeks uh, because we can't, we just can only train a certain group at a time. They really need to receive a training and then they need to shadow some people to watch and listen to them interview. And then they need to start interviewing with somebody observing them and giving them feedback. And then they're independently ready to do that from then on with sort of the normal quality control processes we'd have. So you can see that takes, you know, three to four weeks to get folks up and going. We've definitely uh, started to have the successive waves of the external applicants that, that we hired. Um, and I think we're either on our second or our third set of those that we're training this week. Um, but I can get you the specific numbers. Um, we are right now uh, trying to interview every single case. And I think we've got about an 80 to 85% uh, rate that we, that we have for being able to do complete a full interview with the cases. And we have a whole team of contact tracers and their goal is still right now to try to um, communicate with every single contact. If contacts are all uh, family members in one household and we've done um, the case interview um, some of those contacts we're giving, we know that they're notified as part of that case interview and that conversation and the case is, is sharing information. Sometimes they're on the phone together with us. So some we are closing before we independently have a conversation with every one of them. Um, but we're making sure that every single contact to the best of our ability uh, is notified. Uh, and part of that is because we not only want to be able to give them the information, um, but we also want to be able to identify if they need some help with resources. Right. And what was the timing for that? Is there an average or a median for how long it takes to notify a close contact that they have been exposed? Um, I, I will see if we have a way that that's actually measurable. The state has their contact database. It's completely separate from the regular disease reporting database. And in fact, the COVID-19 data itself is so voluminous at this point that they've moved it out of the database from the other diseases. So I need to see if that capacity is built in there. I would say on average right now, we are probably having a day or so delay from the time the healthcare provider gets the lab result to the time that it actually gets transmitted from the lab to us in public health. Uh, and then once we reach the case, which our goal is to call them within 24 hours of receiving the result, uh, then we've, we need to reach them for interview. Uh, and so about the 85% the that we're reaching, we're reaching those within 72 hours. Uh, and then from there, we need to go ahead and notify contacts. And I think we, you know, we're trying to turn that around so that we're notifying contacts within the day or 24 hours of getting their names. 
um, but you can see in there that there's a few days lag. Some other diseases, that is not so important because some diseases have a long, what we call an incubation period, which is the time between the day that you were exposed and got germs in your body to the day that you actually can spread those germs to other people in a way that makes them sick. So with some of our other diseases, if we've got a week of time in there between when you get exposed and when you actually uh, become symptomatic and are infectious to other people, that's enough time in there for all of those pieces of the process to work out. Uh, COVID-19, uh, people on average, median length of time before they um, become symptomatic, it's about four to five days. And we know that you can become infectious two to three days before that. So if you do the math going forwards and backwards, you'll see that uh, people can become infectious really within a day or two of getting exposed. And so that's a lot of work for us to try to fit in that fast. That's why um, in response to Pat's question, will we ever get on top of it if, this, if these pieces of contact tracing aren't 100% perfect? That's not the only tool in our toolkit and we won't be able to rely on that. And part of that is no matter what perfect system we made of staffing, there are inherent systems issues with labs getting to us with healthcare and data, but there's also just inherent rapidity, which with this virus becomes infectious in a person once they're exposed to it. That's just a challenge, which is why we need to worry more about some of those prevention behaviors uh, and ways of setting up environments that are more safe for prevention. All right. Uh, well, I think I have um, at least one uh, Brad, I'll follow up with you after this. And um, Pat, we uh, shared the link, uh, chatted that link out to the dashboard. And there you'll see if you hover over each week, the week beginning with that date. Um, and if, if anybody has any questions on that, please feel free to uh, reach out to me. Um, and uh, again, I will post this on um, Multco Presents YouTube channel if anybody needs to refer to it later. Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next week.